All right, welcome. Thank you for joining this lightning talk session on humanizing learning. We have two chat options, one on the right hand screen and one in the blue bar below the video. To best organize questions for the speakers, we would like to use the chat feature in the blue bar for that purpose, but we will be monitoring both chats for your questions and comments. Please participate in the session by sharing thoughts, posting links to resources, and or asking your questions. To help our moderator, if you are asking a question to the speakers, please use a question mark at the beginning of the question. This makes it easy for us to scroll through and identify the questions. Now I'd like to hand it off to our moderator for this session, Van Davis, and we'll get started. Well, good morning or afternoon, depending upon where you are, folks. We are so happy to have you with us this morning. Um, it is my pleasure to be moderating this lightning talk on humanizing learning with Brett Christie, Cynthia Suarez, and Sarah Saxton Frump. Um, before we get started, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves, say a little bit about the organization that they're from, and then we will get started. Uh, Brett, could you uh, start us off by introducing yourself, please? Sure. Thanks, Van. Hi, everybody. I'm Brett Christie, and I'm VP for Learning Design and Inclusivity at O'Donnell Learn. And we're a learning design firm that's been around for approximately 30 years. And I've been in that position for about a year and a half. And before that, 25 years of higher ed, faculty ranks, and then faculty developer at the campus at system-wide level. Cynthia? Hi, y'all. Cynthia Suarez coming to you from Austin, Texas. Pronouns are she, her. I am director of coaching at Peloton U, part of the hybrid college network. And Sarah. Thanks, Van. Uh, my name is Sarah Saxton Frump. I'm also coming to you from Austin, Texas. Pronouns are she, her, and I'm the co founder and COO of Peloton U. Uh, we were one of the first hybrid colleges, which we'll tell you all about uh, a little bit more here in a bit, um, and are focused both on serving folks, uh, post traditional students in Central Texas, as well as uh, developing the hybrid college network across the country and doing some more coaching ourselves as we grow. Um, before that was a K-12 educator. I was a social studies teacher and a principal. Um, so still uh, have some dorky ninth, former ninth grade teacher tendencies. Uh, so be warned, but I'll try to be on my best and most professional behavior today. I promise. Back to you, Van. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. So let me tell you how this is going to work this morning. Um, our esteemed uh, presenters here have uh, prepared some brief remarks. What we'll do is we're going to be starting with Brett. We'll have an opportunity for you to ask a couple of questions uh, after his presentation, and then we'll throw it over to Cynthia and Sarah. You'll have an opportunity to ask a couple of questions after their presentation, and then we should have a good 15, 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, I will go ahead and appeal to your better selves and ask you to um, put those questions into the chat because on behalf of the panelists, if you don't, they're going to be stuck with me asking them questions. And I don't think any of us want that to happen. Uh, so as you are listening to uh, these presentations, please throw those questions into the chat. As Catherine said, it will help if you put a question mark in front of them so uh, we don't miss them. And with that in mind, Brett, um, I'm going to throw it over to you to get us started today. Great. Thank you, Van. And let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'll talk about how to ensure purposeful learning in the now normal. People have different terms for where we are now and where we're going, but we're just sort of calling it the now normal. And we'll talk a little bit about how that's changed and what that means to making sure things are purposeful and humanizing what that means um, to me, my efforts always been ensuring that the greatest number and diversity of students is successful. So it's been a big part of my background humanizing. Um, I think that, uh, you know, increasingly it's certainly important going forward. And one thing that I've always tuned into is particularly the first generation student experience, which has been my background. And I can really connect to some of those things and how that relates to humanizing. So let's go to the next slide. And so the need for it ever more so these days is the complexity of the student experience and the learning experience. And we've got students who are attending courses in all different types of formats. I've worked with campuses that have had as many as 11 different delivery formats this current term. It's overwhelming, it's crazy for students and for faculty to try and make sense of that sometimes. So how do you do that while still retaining some sense of a humanizing student-centered experience? And so 
we've been working on that quite a bit to ensure that students are able to on the go, have access to all the resources they need, be able to tap into the experiences, be present live, do things asynchronously. Even in blended high flex environments, how do you enable that to happen between two different audiences essentially um, in a synchronous matter? So we've really focused on how to enable that complexity to happen, but still keep that humanized type experience. So on to the next slide. And our framework, purposeful learning, I've used that term once already, and I'll keep using that. Purposeful learning to us really means that you have an experience that you've developed for your students where first there's a sense of welcome, belonging, you're humanizing throughout, that that affect of domain matters, that feeling matters, that connecting matters, getting students engaged and involved as much as possible and creating meaning for them as you go throughout the experience. Um, one of the things I can give you a link to in just a bit is a very brief video on how we frame that, which I sort of just covered, but we go a little bit deeper into it. So on to the next slide. So making it about students, um, we're finally getting this groundswell, I think, where the learning experience is going to become more about students um, because teaching is about people. It's not about content. And I think we're getting more and more people to realize that, that it's not about putting up that content expert at the front of the classroom and therefore learning will happen because you've got a very smart person talking and, and a group of students hopefully paying attention and absorbing and being able to take those tests. But it's really about a different type of experience and how do you make it about the student's experience? How, how do you make it for them, not for the instructor or not about the content? So on to the next slide. The first thing that we do when we work with faculty is we start with learner empathy. And we've developed this exercise over the last couple of years and, and I have a handout I can link you to. It's actually on the last slide, so we don't need to worry about multiple links. You have one slide with all of it. But this is where we work with instructors to get them to think about the student experience and where the students are coming from and the different needs that they'll have. And sometimes it's needs related to food insecurity and housing insecurity and those things that students might be dealing with or how they learn and what they need to be able to learn effectively. So we actually put them through this learner empathy exercise. And what it does essentially is it gets the instructors to start thinking about Maslow's before getting to Bloom's, is those needs need to be met and students need to feel good about that and on solid footing before they can move up Bloom's with you and be able to go to a higher level of performance and thinking. So that's been really essential and it's really helped us at the beginning and working with faculty to kind of flip that switch on making it about the students. It really sends a message and takes them there deeply. On to the next slide. And then we talk about the student experience and what it's like. And so here would be a, you know, a screenshot of a common synchronous experience where you may have 40 students, let's say. In some cases, there might be multiple screens, could be many more students, but how are the students engaging in your experience? How do they feel belonging? How do they feel connected to you? And so what are the ways that you can do that synchronously and asynchronously? And there's that balance. Um, who are your students and what are their experiences like? So if we just go to the next slide real quick, you can see some of the things that we're dealing with. I mentioned food insecurity. There may be depression. Um, their parents, their working, um, their caregivers, um, low bandwidth, all of those different things. Um, is it SES, are they first gen, um, anxiety, those types of things. So thinking about what's behind the individual thumbnails that we're seeing on the screen and how we get to know that about those students and then how we can anticipate or how we can support them, how we can let them know that we care and how we can go forward with our courses in that way where we do have empathy and we do humanize things as we go forward. And I'll get to more specific examples. Uh, let's go to the next slide briefly, because as we talk about cameras on or off, this is something that I'm real sensitive about because I hear kind of the immediate reaction from some faculty is, well, their cameras are off, therefore they're disengaged, they're disrespectful, they've checked out. And that's not necessarily the case. There are reasons behind that um, why they would have their cameras off. And so there's actually some new research that came out in the spring, and we'll go to the next bit here, that shows what those reasons are as far as why students may not turn on their cameras. And you can see how common some of those reasons are. And then also what's critical to think about is statistical significance in some of those reasons for URM versus non-URM students. So that can kind of get you to reflect as well. Okay, 
what is the student environment like and condition like, and how is it different for some students than others? I think back to the beginning of the pandemic and some students were able to retreat to vacation homes, high bandwidth, plenty of space, plenty of warmth, not working, all of those things. Other students had to do multiple juggling and very traumatic experiences and were um, frontline workers at risk. So um, it's important to think about what's behind them not being on camera and then having multiple tools to be able to connect with them synchronously and asynchronously where they feel like they're connected to you and you're connected to them, even more so they're connected to their peers. So there's peer-to-peer -peer interaction. On to the next slide. So one of the things that a lot of our instructors have adopted is this learner connectedness survey that we developed. And this is on the last slide. Um, let me talk about it first though. So what, what we do on the first screen is we ask students, this is voluntary, none of the individual items are required and completing it's not a requirement, it's not an assignment. Some instructors, if they wanna give cre extra credit or any credit, that's, that's fine, that's up to them. But really we allow them to do adopt this however they feel. Um, but it asks first, things about name and identity, because the name is sort of the gateway to identity and you want to be able to know the student's identity and you want them to know that they can hold that identity and bring them forward, bring that forward into the classroom, that that's a welcome thing and that it contributes to the makeup of the course and the discourse that takes place. And then we talk about their um, situational factors that they have, you know, how many hours they might be working, um, are they commuting if that's a factor, if it's an on-site course, um, what is their bandwidth like, their technology access like? So all of those different things that make up the learner profile, that information just goes to the instructor and the instructor can at a glance, look at these different things and can also look for where they might check in with students on some things. And then they can, the instructor can reflect on how they're making their content more accessible or available to students. Um, and we'll talk about that and I'll use that term intentionality coming up. So the link you'll get to at the end of the session on the last slide will take you to a Google form that will actually be a copy form that you can create and have this for yourselves to adapt or adopt. It won't be a form that we're managing for any of you. It's a form that you can take and use on your own. So on to the next slide. Okay, and then shifting how you actually design, deliver, and engage with your students. So I've talked about sort of some themes about empathy, about students, and about getting connected in general and doing those things early and often. But then if we talk about designing and delivering and engaging sort of in process, let's go forward to the next slide. So I mentioned purposeful learning earlier, and we actually have created a framework. And this framework is something we built in house, but it's also based on looking at the research from decades um, this is something similar to what I developed for the Cal State University system in, let's see, 2011 and used that for about 10, almost 10 years with thousands of instructors and their students to develop courses that were actually more effective, proven to be more effective and closed gaps, equity gaps. So what we have here is eight principles of effective learning. And on the left, you'll see items that are probably thought of more as the functional components of a course. And you can relate to these and we dive deeper into these and we really go into things like authentic learning to make sure that that has more connection, uh, intentional instruction to make sure that it's um, designed, sequenced and chunked and cognitive loads taken into consideration. I wanna be mindful of time here. The right side is we really take a heavy balance more than any other um, frameworks or rubrics that I've seen out there on the um, student and really looking at humanizing empathy classes community. It's got to be about a community. It's got to be about them and how they interact and learn together. And of course, access, accessibility, affordability, equity, and inclusion. So all of those things are factored in to make it more about the student and more humanized as we go. Uh, next slide. And you'll have a copy of that as well at the end. And it's got 30 total objectives across those eight um, elements. So it's pretty reasonable, pretty manageable. And then another thing we do with instructors is we have them examine their syllabus, critically examine that syllabus and look at the tone and language. I love some of the research that's come out recently on how tone has a significant difference on how students perceive the course and the approachability of the instructor, and therefore whether or not they're going to ask for help when they need it. Um, particularly for, again, for URM students, that's been shown in the data and Oregon State has some great um, data. And so this is a resource we've developed to look at some of the main components you would see across syllabi 
and how you can look at a welcoming tone versus an unwelcoming tone and how those subtle differences can mean a lot and they can really add up. On to the next slide. So that handout's available for you. And then one of the last things is we'll talk about accessibility. I've been working in accessibility and universal design for learning since 2005 and have developed a lot of resources and programs there. And related to what we've gone through in the remote switch to wrap um, online instruction and then now continued um, progression toward blended and online instruction is we saw a lot of people go into these very large recordings and pushing those at students and there were access issues. Students didn't have the bandwidth. We had to then create hotspots for them in parking lots. They had to sit in the cold and have their car running and try and access class. That, that wasn't fair. So then getting them to more um, create these more online learning experiences using Zoom and starting to use some of the tools. Uh, the instructor in the middle there is just starting to use Zoom, isn't doing it effectively. Students are kind of lost. It's all about text. It's all about one-way delivery. But on the right side, we see that there's a more intentional format happening where um, they're, they're chunking the content more. They're starting to bring in visuals. They're putting resources in the chat. They're getting students engaged in the chat. There's a conversation happening. And also they're recording it and they're captioning it. So there are those options available for students for, for review as that's posted. So those are some of the things we're doing to shift to make it also humanized, but also more inclusive. And then on to the next slide. And I'll just give you sort of a summary wrap up and then we'll go to questions. So these are all the resources that I had mentioned and you would be able to link to them right from this one slide here as those become available through the conference program. All right, I think I stayed within. Um, did we have any questions come through? Well, we don't have any yet. So let me ask uh, one while we're waiting for other folks to provide questions. And you've you've talked about some uh, a number of really wonderful things that faculty can do, Brett, to uh, better meet the needs of students and to really center the learner experience. If faculty could only implement one or two of these things, which ones would you recommend? What, what do you think may be the most critical in creating that sense of belonging and learner centeredness? Yeah, you know, I, I would say the first thing is doing the empathy mapping, because again, that's, that's what has flipped it or triggered it to be more about the students. So really starting there. And then from there, it it then informs and feeds into starting to change your syllabus, starting to change your language, um, the way you interact with students, creating community, all of those things. And I've got a, another quick question for you again. And, and folks, I, I can guarantee you our panelists don't want me to be the one that asks them the questions. So please put your questions into chat. Um, we'll be keeping an eye out on them. Um, We've got a question here from Tara Proper. Uh, you've discussed empathetic approaches to undertaking synchronous learning. What do you find key in humanizing asynchronous learning environments? Yeah, again, for asynchronous, absolutely, because that's going to be a big reality. Is you know you don't want to be you don't want the course to be about that Monday, Wednesday, Friday, nine through ten bubble where there's the content exchange from the instructor. You really want it to carry on outside of that. There's so much more time. An opportunity. So doing the asynchronous experiences, it's how do you then carry that over into the asynchronous or if it's entirely asynchronous, which I realize that might be the question for asynchronous only, how are you doing that? Um, you know, you can create a welcome video as an instructor, create a more humanized syllabus. One of the resources I didn't put in there because time was a constraint um, is we have this um, enhancing your syllabus checklist. And then with instructors, besides tone and how to enhance your syllabus and look at this checklist, is we also give them many examples where an instructor has created a more humanized visual syllabus. And so how do you maintain that word-based syllabus that's for the records for the department or for accreditation, but then copy and paste that accessible format into something that's more visual and humanized. But again, creating that welcome video and then starting dialogue with the students, um, connecting with them, but also connecting them with each other so that that learning community can proceed and take place and have that grounding. One uh, last question before we uh, move on to uh, Sarah and Cynthia from Peloton U. Uh, Amanda uh, Rosenweig 
has asked, have you had faculty pushback with creating accessibility mat accessible materials or are the resources and manpower provided to the faculty, um, such as an accessibility office or team that does the compliance checks and creates the proper transcripts, et cetera? Yeah, so that's, um, sorry, I'm seeing two different questions here and I'll get to the second one and just I'll text to Tara. Um, yeah, so Amanda, that's something where, yeah, pushback has been a big thing. And the pushback has never been about faculty not caring about students or students with disabilities. It's really been a workload issue and, a, and really also not understanding the issues, um, not understanding sometimes how they can do small things as part of their workflows and develop a Word doc or a PowerPoint presentation. How can they make that more accessible? So it's really about raising awareness and then giving them a small tool set that can make changes. And then hopefully the institution is going to have additional resources that can back them up, um, that they're adopting more accessible technologies or that they do have a center that's going to be able to create an accessible version or do captioning and things like that. So it's really a combination. But yeah, fashion, there's been faculty pushback, but it always comes down to workload and sometimes lack of understanding, but never that they don't want to help students. Excellent. And I would just um, tell folks very quickly that if you're looking for the deck, you can find the deck uh, in the files below the session description. So that should be able to get you access to the deck with the um, links that uh, Brett has uh, provided for us. That one last question from Tara Proper. Uh, Proper, do they have access to that syllabus checklist that you've been talking about, Brett? Yeah, you know, to keep myself in time, to constrain myself, I didn't put that in there specifically. Um, but I can add that into the chat in probably two or three minutes here. I'll just silently pop that into the chat for folks. Thank you. That's fantastic. So thank you, Brett. We're going to move on to Cynthia and, and Sarah talking about Peloton U and what their experiences have been in working with students and really centering students in the design of services. So I'm going to put it over to you, Cynthia and Sarah. Awesome. Thank you, Van and Catherine. If you can click ahead, probably a couple of slides. I'll just go one more. All right. So Cynthia and I are going to tag team this. We'll try to be as efficient as possible. But Brett, just uh, Cynthia and I have been sort of side chatting and already have shared a resource with one of our colleagues uh, over Slack and are feeling really inspired by the thought thoughtfulness and actionability of, of what you've just shared. And um, I don't know, it just always makes me happy to find kindred souls and brains. Uh, and what I'm hoping for all of you in the audience is that what Cynthia and I are about to share about what we've designed with our students at Peloton U uh, is in many ways sort of an example uh, and a little bit outside of the traditional higher ed system, uh, but a sort of an example of much of what Brett was just talking about when you really are empathizing and designing with the learner. So where we started uh, back in 2012-ish uh, was an understanding that the Typical college, typical college student has very much changed. Um, as many of us uh, on this lightning talk this morning probably know, most people who are going to college are not going as an 18 year old, right out of high school, living on campus, like smoking a hand rolled cigarettes on the quad between classes. That is, that is no longer the sort of primary way that folks engage in college. Most people are older, they're waiting a year, they're parenting, they're working 30 plus hours. And so the, the system as it was designed was really designed for that first time full-time 18 year old, um, but the needs of today's students are quite different. So Catherine, if you can hit the slide for me. And what Peloton U developed and what a couple other organizations like Duet in Boston, and then something called the Da Vinci Extension Program out of uh, the Da Vinci Charter Schools in LA, what we've developed over the last eight-ish years is a model we've come to call the hybrid college model. Um, and we, we all sort of came upon this in our, in our own way, but it was very much in response to the needs that our students were sharing with us. We were all sort of in education. We were watching uh, traditionally aged students with very non-traditional lives try to participate in the sort of standard post-secondary experience. Uh, and we're really floundering, but not because of effort or because of uh, desire, uh, but because they had different needs. And where we've landed in the hybrid college model is a blend of, um, frankly, two very ordinary interventions. Uh, we've got competency-based degree programs, which afford students the flexibility that they really need. Uh, this is both in terms of skill level and uh, professional experience and uh, schedule. And then really robust 
personalized, individualized support. Um, this is the majority of what the actual hybrid colleges provides. We're partnering with folks to uh, do the actual degree programs. And then what we are offering is this sort of wraparound holistic support that includes coaching, um, pre-COVID included in-person community and study spaces and care to help uh, sort of mitigate all of the other possible barriers that could pop up in a student's life that we may not be experts in solving. So this is the model that we run at Peloton U. And if you can hit the slide for me, Catherine. Uh, there are sort of some key values and beliefs that drive this. And so it was really cool to hear uh, some of this pop up with uh, your talk as well, Brett. A big one is, uh, yes, we want students to be able to earn a degree and receive sort of all of the very tangible benefits that that can afford them. Um, and we also know that for many folks in this country, a post-secondary degree is the most reliable path to sort of a life of, of economic flourishing. And it's a path that is inaccessible uh, and, and inefficient or ineffective, I should say, for, for many students. And so what we want more than anything is for folks to feel a sense of uh, hope, to feel a sense of hope restored, and to experience feelings of belonging when they are participating in Peloton U, whether that's interacting with the staff, our coaches, our support team, each other, um, our materials. Right, And one of the big reasons why we've become so clear about this is that our students have been incredibly generous with their own expertise in their lives and their prior education experiences uh, and have been our co-designers. Um, we have designed basically everything at Peloton uh, with either very significant input or, or they just were the ones that cooked it up in the first place. And I can give some very specific examples of this down the road, but we have students on the board, we have students on our staff, uh, students, these are all talent examples for some reason, but students help us interview every single person who joins our team. Um, and because of that, we are able to truly ensure that what we are operating as a program at any given time is uh, in line with their needs. And then lastly, we try to hold a very open hand about the role the bachelor's degrees can play in people's lives. We think they're a really wonderful path for a lot of people and we want anyone who wants that path to be able to pick it and have an option that works for them. And we know that it is not the only path to living a lovely life. Um, and so we have also designed a process for joining Peloton U that is intended to be very empathetic, very non-judgmental. Um, very sort of, we have a lot of, as far as we'll talk more about this in a bit, but we do a lot of work to help combat shame um, and try to help students experience agency over their own lives and goals, whether that's through our programming or through some other choice. Slide, Catherine. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we are one of uh, the members of the hybrid college networks. So we were one of the, the first few folks to get this model off the ground, but there's about 15 organizations now operating this model around the country. Um, big, small, working adults, fresh out of high school students. We've seen uh, when you design this with students in the community where the students are from, with people from the community, that you are able to take that sort of base flexibility and support uh, framework and contextualize it to the needs of your specific students in your specific community quite effectively. When you bring some of those UDL and human-centered design concepts that Brent was mentioning earlier into the process. And with that, I'm gonna transition it over to Cynthia, who you will hear me call Suarez because we go by last name sometimes. Um, and she's gonna talk a bit more about the specifics of Peloton U's model and what we are doing with our students uh, here in Austin. Thank you so uh, much. Catherine, you can hit two slides, please. Oh, there you go. Awesome, thank you all. So um, as Sarah mentioned, I will dive a little bit more into an overview of the model. So Catherine, you can go ahead and, and hit the next slide, please. Thank you. So this image kind of gets you a visual of our students' journey from the time they first inquire about our programming and speak to our advising team about their interest in our program, all the way through to like graduation. In between there, you have if students are interested and decide to join us an academic onboarding experience, which they do have as a preparation for enrollment in either their associates and or bachelor's degree journey. So when students come to us and connect with our advising team in that first step, 
Um, our advising team does take a neutral advising approach. As Sarah mentioned, um, this is leading with an, an empathy, empathetic uh, gestures to really just inquire about what the students' plans are first. Um, understanding their goals and learning what they're coming to us for is really important in that aspect so we can see how we might be able to support them in their journey. Um, and like Sarah said, we, we do believe that bachelor's degrees are not the only way for students to achieve their plans and goals. And we have a set of resources the advising team has collected that if it is determined we aren't the best option for the students' goals and plans, then we actively support them in connecting with programs that are. So in the advising section, um, the bottom line is that in our neutral advising approach, we're committed to doing the best that we can to be a partner in that journey as students are coming to us with questions about what might be needed for them to achieve their goals and dreams, whether it is with us or not. So you can move to the next slide, uh, Catherine. Thank you. Um, if a student does decide after that conversation or sets of conversations with the advising team that we are the best fit for supporting their dreams and goals, then we move them into the academic onboarding experience, which is a total of eight weeks where we are preparing them for enrollment and connecting them to their coaching and support team, who really is with them every single step of the way moving forward until they finish their degree. Um, you can see on the slide, this includes things like weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, it's very, very relational and focused on the whole person. Um, and we recognize that logistical and ap academic obstacles are only one aspect of what the students' daily experiences will be once they journey through their degrees. So we make it a priority as a coaching and support team to actively embed emotional and psychological um, obstacle identification and support throughout our programming from that point forward. So um, we recognize that this is, we've been told this is unique, but this is truly the crux of our work at Peloton U to focus on emotional barriers first and then academics. Um, we believe it's an essential approach and neuroscience backs us up, um, which says the research says that students and our brains, frankly, often enter academic spaces with lots of existing shame tapes, um, which can get in the way of our learning. And so as the students coaching and support team, we find it's, it's again, the crux of our work to support a change in that relationship students are bringing with them, um, relate, the relationship that could get in the way of their learning. So in academic onboarding, for example, we introduce students to the idea of shame, we encourage them to reflect on that idea and how it might show up for them. Um, in that conversation, uh, it's a great opportunity for them to have a conversation with their coach and support team about how we can support them in those moments when and if those show up throughout the journey. Um, we also prepare them as an example for the CBE uh, feedback cycle with reviewers, which could potentially be another avenue where confirmation of shame tapes they may be bringing with them could show up. So in AO and beyond, we're providing students with support and reframing that experience of uh, their feedback and their existing learning experiences with their current one. Um, and you can go ahead and move ahead. Thank you, Catherine. So again, as Sarah said before too, the, the humanistic approach requires that we do offer the secondary supports that you see here on this slide. Um, because supporting students' logistical, academic, emotional, and psychological needs are so important to us, we have to be ready to support with these as well. So we do provide students with access to technology. Um, that means computers, hotspots, for instance, access to internet, um, scholarships. We've piloted programming to support with mental health needs and childcare needs in the past couple of years. Um, and we really, again, are just kind of honing in on that pulling in community and care wherever we can, which we've learned a lot in the last year plus with COVID about how to do that virtually. Um, but we recognize there's a lot of barriers that we may experience alongside students that we're not even prepared for up to this point. So again, this is a, a critical aspect of our work and we're just here to support students with any and all challenges to support them the best we can through those as they occur. And you can move forward to the next slide. So this is just a, a quick kind of snapshot of the Peloton U student. In a nutshell, our student, 
body is very diverse. Um, the average age of the Peloton U student is 27. And um, when they come in to talk to our advising team at intake, starting salaries average around $21,000 a year. The vast majority of our students, as you're seeing on this slide, work 30 plus hours a week. They identify as people of color, first generation students, and almost half are parents. And you can move on to the next slide. So in a nutshell, our students, they're showing us that better is possible with 76% of the students who've started with us at Peloton U having finished their degrees already or still with us working on their degree. 116 total degrees have been earned and 79% of our students are currently on track to graduate on time. Um, in addition, we're seeing our bachelor's degree earners have earned a $20,000 per year wage gain. Um, and 57% uh, of our associate students are graduating within the three-year graduation rate. A quick note that our persistence data is tracked a little differently at Peloton U because of our tender age. So um, soon we'll be able to layer in the more traditional six-year look back data, but wanted to offer this as a quick snapshot of what our students are teaching us about what is possible. And I'll pass it back to you, Sarah. Thanks, Cynthia. And Catherine, you can hit the next slide, please. So I just wanted to sort of wrap us up with a, a quote from one of our students. This was actually our first student board member who also uh, was the uh, site director of a, a NACI accredited early childhood center here in Austin. Um, one of the students I coached way back in the day when I was still coaching and then unfortunately had to give her up once my responsibilities changed. But she had been in school on and off since 1984, which not to date myself, but I'm going to, is the year I was born. Uh, and when she came to us, she had raised uh, grown, grown children who were largely out of the house. One was about to lap her and earn his bachelor's degree and then go on to get his master's. Um, and because of her sort of 60 plus hour a week uh, work schedule, her responsibilities at home, her partnership still being very involved with her, her kids' lives and her church community, had just never been able to, to figure out how to get a bachelor's degree while doing all of those other things, right? It felt like there was an either or, uh, sort of a, a sucker's choice, if you will. Um, and one of the things that Sheila has been really gracious to share with us over the years, um, and she's an alum now, she's earned her bachelor's degree and, and continues to be a huge part of our community. But one of the things she was gracious to share with us is that uh, sort of Peloton U was the and for her, right? The way that we bring this flexibility and support, right? And the, the, the reasons we even know to combine those things that way in the first place is because of, you know, uh, Sheila's predecessors before she joined us. Um, but that that combination of things allowed her to fit college with the kind of support that she needed around the rest of her life and sort of fill it in in some of those empty spots. She used to tell me about how she'd have to lock herself in the bathroom sometimes uh, to get some peace and quiet to work on school at home because uh, her her husband and her grown son wouldn't leave her alone, uh, right? But like she could find a place to slot it in. And so as we're wrapping up and, and we'll kick it over here to questions a little bit, um, happy to share, we've learned a lot uh, in the last year and a half uh, going to a fully virtual version of our programming around um, how much in-person matters. It, it does matter, but not as much as we thought. Um, the future of the hybrid college network is really exciting. Sort of all of these individual nonprofits are in this sort of affiliate group together. We're all continuing to grow. Um, and we all will continue to have this place-based focus in our original sort of regions and cities. Um, and then because of what we have learned at Peloton and what our students have helped us learn over the last year and a half, uh, Peloton U will now grow uh, nationally to new communities where that full place-based hybrid college model might not be the right fit or might not be the right place to start. Um, and so for us, that's all about expanding access to more types of students and learners. And uh, we are like, we've been uh, piloting that for about a year and have already learned so very much from our new non-Austin students about how to design with them and for them in, in these new communities and are pumped to see what else we learn and probably steal some resources from Brett to help us learn it better uh, over the next few years. So with that, Van, I'll, I'll shush my mouth and kick it back to you. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, so full disclosure, I once served on the board of Peloton back in the day. And uh, the reason you see such a huge grin on my face is hearing you know, Sarah and Cynthia talk about how the organization has grown and, and hearing Brett talk about some of the science behind that. 
uh, and what O'Donnell Learn is doing as well to to help faculty who maybe don't have the same sort of resources to community that uh, Peloton does. So seeing all of that um, really does my heart some good. So thank y'all. Thank all three of y'all so much uh, this morning. So we're, we're, while we're waiting for questions to come in, uh, I do have a question for, for Sarah and Cynthia, uh, something that you touched on there at the end, Sarah. Um, and that is, you know, your model has changed because of COVID. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the way that you support students has changed um, since COVID as you've begun to move to a more virtual environment. Yeah, absolutely. And Cynthia, I'll, I'll start us off, but feel free to, to jump in. I think the, the biggest uh, insight that came to, or that well, blew up words, the biggest thing we've learned is, is what I started to allude to around the importance of in-person. Um, and it's, it's kind of a little bit comical because it, the in-person component of our work as the sort of like um, chief program officer, even though that's not my job title, but it's one of my functions as a chief program officer was one of the things where I'd really sort of dug my heels in and been like, nope, that like we have to keep this uh, no matter what, like this is so important for students. We have to like help them build the habit of being back in school. They have to come into our study space in order to do that. Like in-person has to be a huge part of our program. Uh, and it's just such a, as, as somebody who is so diehard about designing with and for students and was so stubborn about something students said was annoying, but I was sure it was good for them. Uh, it was just really humbling to be so dang wrong, right? To get into COVID and find out that our Austin students were perfectly capable of doing awesome in school in a pandemic in a fully virtual environment. Our coaches could still build those deep, safe uh, relationships with students uh, and that they could do those without being required to come into the space because the instinct behind it was accurate, which was that students wanted and needed help building new routines. But the manifestation of it was, uh, I was overvaluing that that had to be done in person at one of our spaces. And so our coaches very brilliantly, and I'm sure some they can think back to some examples. Like I remember her telling me stories about coaches like, on FaceTime, walking around a student's house with them via FaceTime, trying to help them figure out like, okay, where can you carve out some like clean surface space where your kids won't bug you and your husband knows to bugger off, right? It's like get that protected study space at home. Um, that was a huge piece of it. Um, and so it's still useful to have the space for some students. We have it, we have it open for folks uh, and we have figured out how to sort of do that safely. Um, but it is, we have changed the default sort of programming path to be that uh, you can do this completely virtually, whether you're in Austin or not. Cynthia, any other sort of big COVID learnings we should share? What was the big one that came to mind? That's a big one. Um, but I also think about there, there are still students teaching us that there are other things that we can support them with while also being virtual and that still being challenging for them. And so I also think about, you know, the offering opportunities throughout their enrollment cycles for us to kind of pause, but also take it a little bit slower and keep supporting them. Um, and a, a lot of students kind of needing time uh, to really kind of reset, really plan that because initially that planning and adjustments were challenging for them. Um, and then for some still, I think with students who have small, small children, um, the physical spaces are places that they're gravitating towards still. So figuring out those subgroups of students that um, have unique situations, but also needing to develop some more support still um, in this period. Sure. So we've got a question that I think has, has come in for, for all three of our presenters today from uh, Naomi Aguiar. Naomi, my apologies if I mispronounced your last name there. Uh, and that is, what do faculty need to do in order to be able to support students on this level? In other words, if faculty are struggling with issues similar to students, what resources need to be in place to ensure that they're able to meet student needs? And I, actually, I think that that's a, a brilliant question because we do know from the research that um, we have faculty that are struggling with some of the same um, needs that our students are struggling with as well. So wondering which of y'all might like to take the first crack at this. 
this is the only other soapbox I love getting on more than I love getting on designing with students for students. Um, <laughs> but I will, I will, I will try to, um, this like gets me real hot under the collar. So as a, uh, in a good way, as a recovering, like martyr complex burnout with a really high ACEs score and uh, took like a $50,000 pay cut when I started Peloton U on like so many levels, this relates very personally, um, but is also the other thing I sort of feel most passionate about at Peloton U, which is building a workplace that is truly sustainable and healthy for educators to be a part of um, and be able to stay for as long or as little as they want to and not feel like they are getting burnt out or experiencing compassion fatigue, et cetera. So with all that sort of said, the one other caveat I'll offer before I um, share maybe things that are actually helpful uh, or actionable is we have a, an incredibly high degree of autonomy at Peloton U, right? So we have university partners uh, who are wonderful at all the sort of curriculum pieces, but we don't have to, we don't participate in their systems or uh, time off schedules or, or anything like that. We are sort of our own entity and are able to completely shape and uh, honestly controls sort of how we think about this. And so few big items. And again, Cynthia is the, the coachiest coach of all the coaches um, who feel free to chime in, but big things. One is uh, we try to manage each other uh, as we coach our students, which is focused on partnership, grace, uh, like empowerment agency, et cetera. And so if, you know, one of our coaches had a really terrible migraine on Friday, so she stopped working early and rescheduled some meetings. Great. Like she, we, I trust her to navigate her schedule that she needs to navigate in order to take good care of herself and be able to take good care of other people in the same way that we would trust a student who's like, Hey, I'm sorry. We had a coaching meeting scheduled tonight. My childcare fell through. I got to reschedule with you for Friday to do the same thing and then follow up and make sure they're okay and see what else they can need. So I think trusting, uh, being trusted and, and trusting folks to take care of themselves and, and be flexible. <laughs> How about that? Flexible and supportive. Here we go. Uh, to be, uh, flexible with their, their time and their energy to sort of serve themselves best. Um, we also try to, uh, make sure that our full compensation package, both from a sort of, uh, income and all of the other ways that compensation can show up in terms of benefits and flexibility and PTO, um, are really robust, uh, and account for the sort of diversity of needs that our teammates have. Um, and then we do, a, we do a lot of helping for each other. So one of our, uh, coworker, as an example, uh, one of our coworkers, uh, fathers is very sick and there's a lot of financial strain on her family. She's on the younger side, immigrant family from Kenya, uh, and asked if it would be possible to pull some, her end of year bonus, uh, up so that she could have some help financially when she needed it. And so that was a thing that we were able to do and, and flex with quite, uh, quite easily. So again, that's, I feel like we're kind of lucky that we can do those sorts of things, but we try to walk the walk with each other same way we do with our students, um, try to make sure that some of the, uh, more like e easier to meet Maslow's things are taken care of as much as we can via, um, Peloton U and then also try to be as generous as we can, uh, to meet the needs of our team, um, when they're experiencing stressors in their own lives. It's a little bit ramblier than I expected it to be. Apologies, but Cynthia, anything you want to chime in with? there. No, no need. This is more my obsession. <laughs> Brett, what about you? Yeah, I, I think similar, creating a culture of care and support. Uh, what can you do for that, you know, as an institution? And, you know, we've seen the research, particularly in the last year on the extreme level of burnout, anxiety and depression, looking at faculty, looking at staff. So how do we also provide care for them as well? Um, when we talk about the workplace, how do we think about that differently? Um, when we think about our institutional mission and student success, how do we reevaluate that? Because student success means faculty success in many ways. So how do we really set that up to happen? Um, related to online, most faculty before the pandemic had not taught online. Even fewer had taken a fully online course, so they didn't have the student experience in going through that. And now all of a sudden we're in this whole new 
realms. I think it's it's really stepping back and thinking about operationally how things need to be much different. Um, it's not a matter of returning to where we were. It's it's how do we progress differently and more effectively and with more you know care and and uh, being intentional. So, Brett, that that's a perfect segue into a question that I have for you while we're waiting for other folks to to chime in with their questions and. You know, you talked about how important it is for faculty to connect with students, um, but there's challenges of doing that in a virtual environment, especially if for very good and compelling reasons, students have their cameras off um, or students don't feel comfortable sharing. So can you talk a little bit about how students, can, how faculty can better connect with students in this virtual environment where there are some of these impediments that maybe don't necessarily manifest themselves in the same way in face-to-face -face courses? Sure. Yeah. And, and, and right now we're connecting in a live environment. We're having a dialogue. We're connected. Our cameras are on all that. Things are working great. But we have to remember that connecting to students doesn't happen to have to happen live. It needs to happen in many other ways. And so how do you think as an instructor, these are the things that I'm going to do to connect with the student during those live synchronous moments, if that's the case, how I'm gonna do that, how I'm gonna create a community in the course. So they're, all, they're also connecting with each other, but then how do I take that into the asynchronous environment the rest of the week throughout the term? So I know what some instructors have done that's been really effective is besides that welcome video at the beginning is they'll continually create these small bumper videos. Maybe it's a very short, and these are informal videos. They're not high production, high stress. They don't need to be a big workload. They can be done on the iPhone, um, in your office, wherever you want. But how do you create those videos that you can embed going into a module and coming out of a module that keep you connected and help direct students to the main points and keep you present as they go through that content asynchronously so that you continue to be part of what they do outside of the classroom, outside of the synchronous meetings, um, and then also setting them up to be able to do things together and have that community. So if anyone wanted to look at Michael Wesch and his work that he's done to create these great bumper videos um, I know Karen Costa has done some great things. I can drop those in the chat. Um, you know, Michelle Pekansky Brock, all these people that are doing wonderful things to create that connected experience throughout. So again, that as you slip out of the live environment like we have now, it doesn't just become all about content. And you know, good luck to you. That, that is, that's a, first of all, those, those are some great resources, but that's um, some great insight, especially this idea that um, we don't have to lose connection when we become asynchronous, that it's possible to still have connection there. Um, that actually leads me to a, a question for Sarah and Cynthia about how they create connection with their Peloton students. You go out of the way to make sure that, um, students are really centered in the design of learning at Peloton U um, and you design for learning with students. Can you give us an example of what that looks like in action, how you design with students? Cynthia, you wanna take this one? I'm thinking about the AO revamp that you just did. <laughs> yeah, so um, to that example, AO, our academic onboarding experience that happens pretty much at the beginning once they decide this is the best fit for them and their goals. Um, you know, we realize there, there happened to be like a pandemic and a curriculum shift around the same time at SNHU, one of our primary partners. And so um, we recognized a need to, to adjust our AO academic onboarding experience based on what we were seeing um, students challenged with during that period of not being able to submit projects, term requirements being more challenging to meet to meet that fell federal federal Pell and loans requirements, for example. And so we were hearing that directly from them, and as a coaching team came together to figure out that if we can bump up some of the learning that's required to kind of get projects queued up and ready to go in AO, let's let's figure that out and let's let's make some changes happen. So we did that around this time last year. And even in the last couple of months, we've, we've tweaked even more as we have learned how to lean into this virtual space um, and prep students in that eight week ramp up period before enrollment to have projects ready, to know what the um, feedback process will be like, 
And we've even included more student voices, like literally on the academic onboarding website so that students are hearing from each other, right? So we've heard from students directly about the challenge spots. We've made adjustments to that ramp up period to support them in ramping up for enrollment. But we also are having student voice in there so that as students are moving through the AO curriculum, they are hearing from other students advice, tips, how they were moving through that particular week of AO so that they can hear from someone else, even though they may not be seeing them in person the way we used to back in the day. Um, so that's one example. I'll also share like, we're talking about budgets and goals for next year. And like, I literally have invited students to panels happening today and tomorrow to sit and chat with me about what are their thoughts about 2022? What are, what are current barriers they're facing when they think about sitting down and doing school? Um, so that we can actively talk about like, okay, well then maybe we need to make sure we've got budget allocated to support you in that way in 2022. And we have a hunch we're on the right track, but we try to get like in the moment feedback through panels and things like that as well. Um, and that's happening today and tomorrow. Yeah, and I think there's a couple other things I'll just chime in with that are, you know, this has been a, we sort of a long track record of, of doing this. So I think back to uh, when we got our first dedicated study space, our students helped us pick the space. They helped us figure out how to uh, physically organize it, what kind of, um, for lack of a better term, like what kind of vibe would be most welcoming for students, but also sort of, you know, how do you split the difference? We're in Austin, it's very casual, but how do you still make it feel aspirational, right? Those were questions students asked. When we talked about uh, expanding hours to, you know, study space hours. Um, students were the ones who asked for it. They were the ones who helped us figure out what those hours should be. Um, our very first ever degree celebration, students helped design the structure of it and then have given feedback repeatedly around how it should be uh, improved and, and evolved over time. Um, and then even, uh, Cynthia, I'm thinking about the AOL role. Uh, so very specifically to COVID and then also designing, you know, with students, our, our coaches very proactively ask for feedback uh, from students and also pay a lot of attention to things that shift uh, with them and we sort of whether it's spoken or unspoken, uh, but just pay very close attention. And one of the things that we noticed over the pa over 2020 uh, was how many more logistical challenges our students were facing because everything was fully virtual. It, uh, a lot of things we used to be able to organically solve because we were next to them in a study space, we couldn't anymore. Uh, and so we ended up creating a new full-time role that is uh, the academic onboarding leader position and her job, and she's also an alum of our associate and bachelor's degree program, her job is to help students tackle all of those logistical issues and some of the academic ones that they hit early in their journey in Pelotonio, right? And again, that was something we, we, we heard from students, we were watching it happen. And then we've got somebody who also has gone through that experience, who is now helping students sort of shepherd themselves through it as well. So we're going to offer those last couple as we're wrapping up. So we're wrapping up here, but I do want to ask, I'm, I'm going to take um, moderator prerogative and ask one last question. Um, and I'm gonna ask our panelists 15 to 20 second answer. Um, what's the one thing that you hope folks walk away with from today, from this conversation? And Brett, can I start with you? Sure, yeah, I hope people can walk away with a sense of how you can make that shift to the more humanized experience for students. So we've given across our panel many different examples, but I hope that people can see an enablement of making that shift and why it's important. Cynthia, what do you hope folks walk away from uh, with from today? I wanna echo Brett, um, but also add that I think something I'm thinking about is to interrogate current practices and wherever possible to really push where you can in those spaces. I know it's harder probably for some than others but interrogating current practices is important. And Sarah? Great final question. Uh, I, would want I want folks to leave with um, an understanding that students are the experts in their own lives and needs. And so if you are not sure what to do, you can ask them uh, and trust, trust their answers. Give it a try. 
So folks, I, I hope you join me in, in thanking these three folks. This has been an amazing panel. Catherine, I think you've got some closing words for us in terms of directions and the rest of today. Yes, Van, I also would like to thank everyone for attending this session. And of course, a huge thank you to our Lightning Talk presenters and our moderator. A session feedback survey should be popping up. Uh, we would really appreciate you taking the time to fill that in. Speakers enjoy receiving your feedback. We recorded this session and it will be available soon for asynchronous viewing. Please join us next for a fun and casual 30 minute networking lunch beginning at 1130 Mountain Time. Live participants will be entered into a drawing for a $75 Amazon gift card. Thank you all. Have a good day and hope you continue to join us.